Luke chapter 19, verses 36 through 40 today is the place I would like to pitch a tent and call your attention to Luke chapter 19, verses 36 through 40. I'm reading from the thundering diction of the King James Version of the Scriptures. Here is what the Bible says. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. When he was come nigh, nigh even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Say amen for the reading. Grab somebody by the hand that you love and you like and you don't mind touching. If you don't want to touch them, you shouldn't have sat by them. We got enough space. Find somebody's hand to hold. Look them in the eye and just say, neighbor, I know God loves you. Tell them I've got proof right now. He's letting you hold my hand. Tell your neighbor, he has been so good to me. Tell them, say, neighbor, the preacher needs your prayers and all of your amens. Today's sermon subject, these folks think I'm stone crazy. Find another hand and tell them they think I'm stone crazy. The grass withers, the flower thereof fades, the word of our God shall last and stand forever. Thank you, ushers, you have done so well. Thank you, choir. You may take your seats. Dr. A.P. Gibbs and his book, Christian Worship, Our Highest Occupation, takes the time to pin what he says is the difference and definitive of three Christian disciplines that we all share. Prayer, praise, and worship. Gibbs says, Pastor, that the occupation of the soul with what it needs lends us to prayer. Pastor Anderson, he says, praise is the occupation of the soul with its blessings that have come from God. But he says, worship is the occupation of the soul, not with what it needs and not praising God for what it does, but simply thanking God for who he is. He goes further to argue that it may be verbal or nonverbal, visible or invisible, cognitive or spiritual, but he says that it is the same around the world. There are moments where you just have to have a God consciousness and thank God for who he is if he does nothing else. I began here because I believe that as a believer in Christ, there are certain standards that go along with worshiping our God. You just can't bring anything to God and expect for him to accept that. So just in case you're confused, there are Hebrew mentions throughout the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nethovim, and the Kethovim that are specific regarding how we ought to honor God. You ought to yada God. It's where you lift your hands cup to tell God thank you for everything he's provided. You ought to told our God. It's where you have enough in you to just say thank you every once in a while. Uh, takes a stingy Christian not to have a thank you sometime. You ought to shabbat 
about God. It's where you do it loudly. It's not a whisper. It's not some secret. You open your mouth and shout things like glory. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb. You tequila God. You sing. You karar God. You dance. It's certain things that just ought to be done. And when you do them as a form of worship, there are standards that come along with it. I began here, Pastor Terry K. Anderson, because as I travel from city to city and county to county, there are moments when I watch stuff that happens in church that gets on my last nerve. It's vexing to watch what some people do in worship because I just don't see it anywhere printed on the pages of Holy Writ. Come here, if you will, as I'm sitting in a small city called Silsby, Texas, where this woman is in the back of church taking a soup can with a drumstick having a field day. I've heard of us playing the drums, I got playing the organ and the trumpet and string the instruments, but I ain't never seen anything about a soup can and a stick. I wanted to go take one or the other from her, the can or the stick, are you listening to me? Come with me and listen to this man in Lafayette, Louisiana, blowing a whistle on the front row. Pastor Washington, I ain't never, I've been black and Baptist all my life. I ain't never seen nobody with a whistle. I'm, I'm from the Ocean of Soul marching band. I'm about to take off marching in this camp. I don't know what to do. But the one that took me the most is this lady. And I'm standing in a citywide crusade on the West Coast. Sister girl is in the back on the last pew. Everett Gill, she has on a blue choir robe, but she's not in the choir. <laughs> she didn't come in there with a blue pom-pom and a red pom-pom weight and two trash can lids. Listen to me. I know you think I'm making this up, but I'm not. Black Baptists don't lie until after we eat and rest. Do you understand? This is the truth. She's back there and wait. Here is the kicker to it, Pastor Anderson. She doesn't strike her crash can lids until after the music dies down and the shouting stops. Then she just goes in, waving her pom-poms, crashing the lids. I'm looking at the pastor as if to say, Doc, you can't control your flock no better than this. She's representing you. She in your church. Take one of those lids at least. That way she can't crash them, you know. By the second night, she had gotten on my nerves so badly, I decided I would nicely, in a very sweet, Christian, kind, cordial demeanor, go up to her and just beg her pardon and please ask her to leave the lids at the house. Are you listening to me? When I approached her, here was what she said. I said to her, I said, sis, you, you know, I see you back here making a joyful noise, you know. And uh, I can tell you're happy to be doing it. And then she just flipped on me. Just the sister in her came out. She said, Dr. Adolph, I can tell you've come back here to tell me to stop doing all of this that you think is a waste of time and energy. She said, but I want you to know I read your bio in the, in the, in the church program. You're not the only one educated here. I too am well educated. She said, I have an earned master's degree from Emory and a PhD from the school where I teach as an adjunct professor. She said, I am a PhD from Berkeley. And she said, I am not crazy. I am in my right mind. I lead a group of students who are chiefly atheists. And not long ago, one of my students asked me if I really believe that if I stop praying, the God I love in public that the stones would cry out. She said, and I took the time to tell that student, as long as I am alive, the stones will never have a chance to because I'm going to praise God with everything I have in me. 
So you say, you can be like the rest of these folks around here and think that I'm stone crazy, but when I look at what God has done for me and my life, I will praise him if I've got to do it all by myself. It is Palm Sunday, ladies and gentlemen, and it is that hallmark occasion where the Christian ought to celebrate the fact that Jesus is headed to the cross. Okay, hold on. I know Dr. Terry K. Anderson pastor said, let me just run it by you one more time. It is the hallmark Sunday in the life of Christianity the world over. It is the Sunday before Easter Sunday morning. The Bible defines this for us as Palm Sunday where they are waving palms before the Lord and shouting Hosanna, Hosanna. We say Hosanna, Hosanna. Save us Lord to the highest and they are shouting because he is headed towards the cross. Okay, third time on the work. I said he is on his way to the cross. Wait, let me just say it four more times. I know it's been a long day, but I said he's on his way. Okay, let me say it for all of y'all in here who still sip communion when it ain't communion Sunday. You got one good lie you can tell that you ain't never forgot, and you still got one bad habit you need work on. I said he's on his way. To the cross. Okay, one more time. I'm going to say it for everybody in here who still got some thug in them, even though the Lord has taken you out of the ghetto. You still got some ghetto in you. I said he's on his way to the cross. And if there is ever a Sunday where we ought to exalt him and bless him and adore him and bless him publicly, it is on a Sunday like today. He has now walked nearly 90 miles, Pastor Anderson. He gets six blocks away and decides to ride the back of a donkey as he's going into Jerusalem. The people can see prophecy fulfilled and they begin shouting shouting uncontrollably and for the first time in the life of Jesus he does not tell the people be quiet he says go on and let it out because I know you've been holding it the religious people who look sanctimonious on the outside but are sinners on the inside called Pharisees go and confront him and say Jesus they are too loud they are overdoing it you need to have them talk it down and Jesus says if these hold their peace see those rocks over there they'll start shouting and join them all by themselves why preach this on today because Lily Grove if there is nothing you gotta hold on to it is the truth of the crucible of the cross of Jesus Christ in a time where preachers are nothing more than life coaches and inspirational motivational speakers I tell you cling to that old rugged cross and march forward into the future and you don't march silently you ought to march triumphantly and victorious in fact, brothers and sisters, I say to you, if you have never gotten happy in church, the next two Sundays are your shout cue. Today he's on the way, and next Sunday he gets up. I need somebody in here who can hear God with all power in the hello of his hand. And for those of you who can testify that he has been there for you your whole life. When you were young and crazy, God was there. When you were headed to nightclubs like me, God was still there. He has never changed his mind about you. He has never forsaken you. When you get into the house of worship like this, how dare you sit on God when God has done everything that he could do for you. How dare you cross your leg, fold your arms and act like God has not been a healer, a doctor, a friend, a bill payer, a way maker, a midnight rider and a bright and morning star. You ought to help me, Lily Grove. You ought to help me just act like you stone crazy and tell somebody if it had not been for the Lord.
Wait, I got to hurry, but let me just go on and tell you this. If your neighbor still looking at you like you crazy, tell your neighbor it ain't safe to sit by me right now. Because I know what he had to bring me from. I know what he had to do for me. I know the miracles he's already performed. And when I pause to thank God for all he's done, my hands automatically raise. My voice automatically shouts, hallelujah, and to God be the glory. Hey, be seated, be seated. What's in this text? I'm almost done us to the law of the Torah, that idea of the new commandment Jesus is about to give. What is it in the text that we find that ought to be suitable for a celebration like this one? Number one, we find a praise that's proper. If it's your birthday, cut a cake. If you got a promotion on your job, Buy a new nameplate. If it's the inauguration of a president, call in the heads of state. But if it's the inaugural march of a king, and that king happens to be your king, how dare you act like this is an ordinary day? The devil is alive. He's on his way, Pastor Terry K. Anderson. He is riding the back of a donkey. And when he gets into the city, there is a trilogy of things that take place. We have prophecy fulfilled, a portrait of peace, and a praise from the people. When they see Jesus on the back of a donkey, they realize it's Zechariah 9 and 9, which is prophecy fulfilled. They understood it like you would understand stuff you learned in vacation Bible school that reminded them that your king is coming to do to show you righteousness and salvation is his to give when they saw Jesus riding on the back of a donkey they realized that the peace of heaven had reached the celestial source of earth in other words the door of the church would be open and never be closed that grace would become the mantra and no longer the law of God but the grace of God they realized that their king had appeared hold on ladies and gentlemen and that sparked a praise in the people because the promise was now present the promise was now present when they saw this they realized that the promise they had been waiting on was now present that they had been reconciled to God that the oppressive regime of the Roman government would at some point be overthrown and that they would win in the end. Thus, they threw, they threw their clothes at his feet and waved palm leaves because their wait was over because the promise was now present. Prophecy had been fulfilled. They had tomorrow's news today. They had the truth that had been to be now realized and they could not hold their peace. Ladies and gentlemen, whenever prophecy is fulfilled it's like having the winning powerball numbers before the powerball is played for you lotto playing christians sitting in here this sunday afternoon if you could imagine me standing here telling you i had a premonition from god for the next powerball and the numbers are 36 14 22 19 37 and 40 and if you play those and win i'm I'm gonna find you you better make sure of that can you imagine how you would shout if those numbers came to pass then listen to this Jesus riding on the back of a donkey it is not a winning lotto ticket it is a prophecy from God that says what I need from God is wrapped in a body and marching through town ladies and gentlemen for those who know him here is what you ought to shout about your promise is present my liberator 
is present. My emancipator is present. My redeemer is present. My God, my grace, and my hope is present. My salvation is present. My justification is present. My expiation is present. My imputation is present. My glorification is present. My peace is present. My portion is present. My provision is present. My protection is present. My healer, my hope, and my help are present. My Lord is present. My God is present. My Christ is present. My life is present. And my joy is present. Who am I preaching to? You ought to tell your neighbor, what I need is present in Jesus Christ. And he is headed to the cross to die for me right now. Dr. Terry K. Anderson, Dr. Neil Roberson calls this the laudum recordum. It's praise that should go on record. Uh, whenever, the whenever the promise is present, it is a laudum recordum. In, in other words, you praise God not for anything he does, but for who he is. Listen because you owe God something you cannot repay him uh, can I just throw this in right quick every now and then you ought to worship God like crazy because you owe God something you know you cannot repay him uh, Mark 14 there's this lady whose name is Mary who gets to the house where they're reclined and about to eat dinner. And uh, you know she's of African descent because she shows up at the party uninvited. Listen, come here. <laughs> she ain't on nobody's guest list. She just showed up with this alabaster box of spike no. She breaks the box and pours this ointment all over Jesus. She perfumes the parameters. The whole house smells so wonderful. But here is why she does it. She knows that she owes him something she cannot repay him. There are people here in this cathedral on this 64th anniversary who owe God big time. Two choirs have sung, deacons have done devotion, and some of y'all ain't moved one muscle. And I say the devil is a liar. You ought to find something in you that says because everything I need is in him, I'm going to bless him because my promise is now present. Hold on. Pastor Anderson, I'm riding to the house the other day. I got off early. I'm going to put on some gym clothes. I'm rushing to the house. And I see a little boy in our neighborhood. Buffalo, he might have been about 12, 13 years old. But he was running with a bicycle. Okay, you don't run with a bike, you ride it. Let me get y'all attention. So I'm, I'm, I'm finna go home, change gym clothes. And there's a kid running with a bicycle through the neighborhood. You don't run with a bike. You, you ride the bike. So I said to myself, oh my God, he's stealing. <laughs> Y'all, I'm from Lakewood, <clears throat> 610 North Wayside. <laughs> if somebody running with a bike that came out of your driveway, are you listening to me? <laughs> so I decided to go ahead and call the authorities in my neighborhood. We don't do that. So I made the block, came back around, and, uh, and Reverend Lewis, I discovered he wasn't dressed like a thief. He had on a helmet, elbow pads, and knee pads. Okay, listen, if you ever been ganked, you don't wear that kind of stuff. You're just trying to get off and run. So realize he wasn't stealing, but behind him, Pastor Anderson, was a tall, strong gentleman I found out was his daddy. And I pulled up on him and I said, sir, is that your kid? Oh, yes, yes. And so I said, man, thank you, because I thought he was stealing a bicycle. He said, no, he turned eight years old today, and I've been promising him a bike since he was six years old. And he didn't wait to learn how to ride it. He was so happy to have his promise, he decided to run with it. I need somebody in here who will run with. Is there any runners in here? It ought to be somebody who says, just because he made the promise and I got it, I'm a runner. Hold on. 
everybody say a praise that's proper. Hold on, let me show you something else we see in this text. We see a protest that's pitiful. There are always people in the act of worship who protest those who decide to honor God properly. There are some folk who will scroll, look at their watch. And I always want to ask Pastor Anson, what you come for? You can scroll at your house. I figure if folk in the mall are shopping, people on the golf course are putting, and folk at the bowling alley are bowling, if you're in church, you may as well do some churching. Isn't that common sense? However, there are those who protest. It's silent, sick, satanic, and sinister. It's been going on a long time. It had its roots when the Pharisees, uh, these people, praising God. They go to Jesus as a part of this eclectic, interesting group of people from the, from, uh, down there in Jerusalem from the temple. There were five groups, Essenes, Sadducees, scribes, zealots, and others, and brothers and sisters. When they see this, they are more only concerned about the keeping of the law outwardly, not making the Roman government mad and making sure they stay paid. Brothers and sisters, everybody that's present didn't come to participate. So they protest, they say, listen, Jesus, rebuke your Talmudim. Tell them, turn it down a notch, because it does not take all of that. Jesus does not usher in the Messianic secret where he often would say, hey, y'all don't tell anybody. Jesus says, nope, on a day like today, I'ma let them loose on y'all because they've been holding it for too long. Can I ask, is there anybody here who was at the early service and at the second service and you at this service, but you've been holding at least one thank you the whole day? You ought to let that joker go right now just to make hell mad and heaven happy. You ought to just lift your hands and just say, I've been saved. Wait, hold on. Ain't nobody saving one. I need somebody over here that's been saving one for a while. You ought to just lift your hands and just say, just because I'm alive, just because I can, just because I got joy still in me. Wait, I think I should warn you. I think I should warn you. Ladies and gentlemen, there will always be those who are silent. They do not wish to get involved. They don't want to see us praise God. The, watch this, the Pharisees, Dr. Terry K. Anderson, are upset about the manner, the meaning, and the measure of the praise that takes place. They don't like the fact that they are throwing their garments at his feet. What significance is this? The tunic and the talent that they wear are now on the ground before him. It was a symbol that he was in authority over everything that they were there with. Brothers and sisters, here's what I've discovered. It's hard to get people to celebrate who he is before they submit to what he is. You can't celebrate it unless you submit it to it. Watch what happens. They get upset, Pastor Anderson, about the meaning of this because they are submitted to him and his rulership and they are upset about the measure of it. They are too loud. I don't know where we got this emotional stuff from where you can only be silent in church and so loud. Brothers and sisters, when you think about who God is, heaven wrapped in a body pulled off divinity wrapped himself in humanity came to walk on earth like us gave up the praises of angels for the curses of men how dare we sit on God on a day like today when he could have let hell be your house but he made heaven your new home I need 50 of y'all in here who can hear God brothers and sisters don't let the 
enemy rob us of this moment and don't let silent protesters make you hold your peace. The Bible tells us how to handle protesters. If you are sitting next to a protester who has not clapped once, who has not shouted ever, and you feel like you are near the frozen chosen and they can only clap or only do stuff at a certain time, let me tell you how to handle them. If you're sitting next to somebody who makes you say, if I get happy, they ain't going to sit by me no more. Here is how you get to them and make sure they never sit by you ever again. Here is how you handle those silent saints who are sitting right in your proximity and they keep looking at their watch like, how long he going to preach? I'm going to preach long enough for the people around you to make you uncomfortable. I hope they get on your everlasting nerve. I hope they make you so mad you don't sit on their road no more. Here is how you handle them. It's a sincere, plausible procurement that sounds like this. When I was sick, you were nowhere to be found. When I was broke, I couldn't even get you to make me a small cash app loan. When I couldn't see my way through, you would ignore my phone call. But when you walked out, God walked in. When you dropped me, God picked me up. When I cried, God wiped every one of my tears. When I got diagnosed, he laid his hand on me. When I went through surgery, he woke me up in recovery, and I was still saved in my right mind. And when I look back over my life to think things over, I'm not going to tone it down. I am going to turn that bad boy up. Wait, I got some Bible to go along with it. Bartimaeus is sitting by the roadside. I'm just teaching the Bible. I'm through. Bartimaeus is sitting by the roadside. He can't see, but he can't hear and he can't talk. He hears a ruckus coming out the city. He says, hey! <laughs> What's all that ruckus? He says, this, this dude Jesus from Nazareth. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He doesn't have a class for screaming or shouting. He doesn't have worship 101 or 102, but he got good sense. Here's what he said, Jesus! Master, have mercy on us. And the protesters near him say, Bart, you overdoing it. You too loud. Turn it down a notch. Isn't it interesting? Bartimaeus, when he shouted after them, was never told to turn it down. But now he's not shouting after them. He's shouting after him, and they got a problem. Tell your neighbor, this shout I'm finna give God ain't for you. You did not wake me up. And if you didn't wake me up, you can't shut me up. I'm gonna open my mouth and tell God how I feel about it. And I plan to protest by giving God more. I think we ought to do it. You ought to be like Bartimaeus for 30 seconds. Open your mouth and just shout, Jesus! There is power in his name. There is healing in his name. There is salvation. I think we ought to shout it one more time. From way in the back, you ought to open your mouth and just shout, Jesus! Somebody in here who knows his name up close, you ought to lift up your hands, open up your mouth, and just shout, Jesus! Anderson but every time I come to Houston I'm reminded of my meager upbringing 8310 Homewood Lane Houston Texas 77021 Lakewood City Gas uh, MB Smiley High School class of 1984 
My mama had children at home, Pastor, and she didn't let us have a dirty house with children there. I was the remote control, the vacuum cleaner, the sweeper, the weed puller. I need somebody who didn't pull some weeds one time, Doc. Just if you can talk to me, please. And on a Saturday morning, she would put on KTSU radio station. And I remember my mother used to love Shirley Season. She would tell this story about this man in church named Shouting John. See, John was in church. He would shout too much for the religious protesters of his day. And so they decided to convene and go out to John's house to tell him, we don't act like that in church. They said, listen, you shout too much, you run too much. And so John said, listen, you see that land you just drove up on? God gave me all of that land. So see those cars over there on the driveway? God bought me all those cars. He said, if I can't shout in your church, hold my mule, I'm going to shout right here. I need 100 of y'all who got a mule your neighbor can hold to tell your neighbor, if you not go help me bless God, get out of my way. I got to get out of here. A praise that's proper. A protest that's pitiful. Watch this. A parallel that's powerful. I'm done, Dr. Anderson. The woman on the West Coast wearing the blue choir robe with the trash can lids gave me one thing I will never forget. She said that as long as she had breath in her body, we would never find out if stones could shout because she wasn't going to ever give them a chance. Jesus says if these hold their peace, the stones will cry out. I know this is metaphoric and it is true in the sense of he is the creator, creation motif. That he can make a, a donkey preach. He can make wine without grapes. Uh, <laughs> help me God. He can make the bitter waters of Mara sweet. So I mean, if he could do all of that, he can make a rock do a holy dance. I got you. But you know, Dr. Anderson, I started thinking, if a rock could talk, what would he say? God, help me. If a rock could articulate, what would the rock say for everybody around him to hear? Maybe the rock would simply say that, that he is Daniel Stone hewn out of a mountain. Maybe he would say the Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust. Maybe he would shout he is my chief and cornerstone. Maybe he would say he is my sure foundation. Maybe he would say, for who is God save the Lord? And who is the rock save the Lord? Maybe he would say, he is my rock and my salvation. And he is my defense. Maybe he would say, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Maybe he would ask the question, where do I go when there's no one else to turn to? And who do I talk to when there's no one else to listen? Who do I lean on when there's no foundation stable? I go to the rock. I know he's able. I go to the rock. I go to the rock of my salvation. I go to the stone that the builders rejected. You run to the mountain and the mountain stands by me. When earth all around me is sinking sand. Upon Christ the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter. When I need a friend. I go to the rock. Ain't he alright? I said ain't he alright? Is there anybody in here got a praise on the inside that you can't wait to get out and you don't mind your dying God? It's what you
you lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord? Ain't he all right? Is there anybody in here who's got a thank you buried on the inside? Well, you don't mind shabbacking the Lord. Well, you just shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. said ain't he all right if you know God's good and his mercy lasts forever shake your neighbor by the hand hold your neighbor's hand y'all ain't grab nobody I said grab your neighbor's hand hold your neighbor by the hand and say neighbor you don't Yes, he did. He delivered me. Yes, he has. Ain't he all right? I said, ain't he all right? Find one more hand. Hold it like you've been born again. Hold it like you got a testimony. And say, neighbor, I'll never find out if a stone can cry out because I got to thank you on the inside that I refuse to let the devil have. Can you see this woman sitting on the back row? A blue pom-pom, a red pom-pom, two trash can lids. By that third night of revival, touch your neighbor right quick and say by night three, sister had recruited her some help. So she bought her other crazy friends with They had the whole back row taken up. I need about five crazy folk who make folk thank you stone crazy to recruit a couple of people right quick. Just ask them, has the Lord been good to you? Y'all ain't recruiting nobody. I said recruit your silent neighbor. Say neighbor, has the Lord made a way for you? Has he blessed you? If he has, tell your neighbor, stand to your feet. Don't let me shout by myself. Don't let me worship by myself. Don't let me praise him by myself. But help me lift him up. My soul didn't got happy. My soul didn't got full. If the Lord has been good to you, They brought signs to church and they held them up all service long. Dr. Anderson, I started reading those signs and the sign said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall be in my mouth. The sign said, bless the Lord, oh my soul and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? If God's been kind and you don't mind having church, lean over and grab your neighbor. Hold them like you've been born again. Y'all ain't grab nobody. Grab your neighbor by the hand. I said grab your neighbor by the hand. Say neighbor. God, help me bless God. The sign that shouted me was lift up your head. Oh, ye gates, be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the king, and the king shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in power. This King of Glory, the Lord who fights my battle for me, has He ever done it for you? If He's done it for you, 
Jesus. Lift your hands. Open your mouth. And just shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Ain't he all right? Say it. Yeah. Say it. Yeah. Say it. Yeah. Say it. Yeah.